Chapter 14, Dr. Dorian. The next day was Saturday. Fern stood at the kitchen sink drying the breakfast dishes as her mother washed them. Mrs. Arable worked silently. She hoped Fern would go out and play with the other children instead of heading for the Zuckerman's barn to sit and watch animals. Charlotte is the best storyteller I've ever heard, said Fern, poking her dish towel into a cereal bowl. Fern, said her mother sternly, you must not invent things. You know spiders don't tell stories. Spiders can't talk. Charlotte can, replied Fern. She doesn't talk very loud, but she talks. What kind of story did she tell you? asked Mrs. Arable. Well, began Fern, she told us about a cousin of hers who caught a fish in her web. Don't you think that's fascinating? Fern, dear, how would a fish get in a spider's web? said Mrs. Arable. You know it couldn't happen. You're making this up. Oh, it happened all right, replied Fern. Charlotte never fibs. This cousin of hers built a web across the stream. One day she was hanging around the web and a tiny fish leaped into the air and got tangled in the web. The fish was caught by one fin, mother. Its tail was wildly thrashing and shining in the sun. Can't you just see the web sagging dangerously under the weight of the fish? Charlotte's cousin kept slipping in, dodging out, and she was beaten mercilessly over the head by the wildly thrashing fish, dancing in, dancing out, throwing. Fern, snapped her mother. Stop it, stop inventing these wild tales. I'm not inventing, said Fern. I'm just telling you the facts. What finally happened? asked her mother, whose curiosity began to get the better of her. Charlotte's cousin won. She wrapped the fish up, then she ate him when she got good and ready. Spiders have to eat, the same as the rest of us. Yes, I suppose they do, said Mrs. Arable. Vaguely, Charlotte has another cousin who is a balloonist. She stands on her head, lets out a lot of line, and is carried aloft on the wind. Mother, wouldn't you simply love to do that? Yes, I would. Come to think of it, replied Mrs. Arable. But Fern, darling, I wish you would play outside today instead of going to Uncle Homer's barn. Find some of your playmates and do something nice outdoors. You're spending too much time in that barn. It isn't good for you to be alone so much. Alone, said Fern. Alone? My best friends are in the barn cellar. It is a very social place, not at all lonely. Fern disappeared after a while, walking down the road toward Zuckerman's. Her mother dusted the sitting room. As she worked, she kept thinking about Fern. It didn't seem natural for a little girl to be so interested in animals. Finally, Mrs. Arabelle made up her mind. She would pay a call on old Dr. Dorian and ask his advice. She got in the car and drove to his office in the village. Dr. Dorian had a thick beard. He was glad to see Mrs. Arabelle and gave her a comfortable chair. It's about Fern, she explained. Fern spends entirely too much time in the Zuckerman's barn. It doesn't seem normal. She sits on a milk stool in a corner of the barn cellar near the pig pen and watches animals hour after hour. She just sits and listens. Dr. Dorian leaned back and closed his eyes. How enchanting, he said. It must be real nice and quiet down there. Homer has some sheep, hasn't he? Yes, yeah, said Mrs. Arable. But it all started with that. Pig, we let Fern raise on a bottle. She calls him Wilbur. Homer bought the pig, and ever since it left our place, Fern has been going to her uncle's to be near it. I've been hearing things about that pig, said Dr. Dorian, opening his eyes. They say he's quite a pig. Have you heard about the words that appeared in the spider's web? Asked Mrs. Arable, nervously. Yes, replied the doctor. Well, do you understand it? Asked Mrs. Arable. Understand what? Do you understand how there could be any writing in a spider's web? Oh no, said Dr. Dorian. I don't understand it. But for that matter, I don't understand how a spider learned to spin a web in the first place. When the words appeared, everyone said they were a miracle, but nobody pointed out that the web itself is a miracle. What's miraculous about a spider's web, said Mrs. Arable. 
I don't understand why you say a web is a miracle. It's just a web. Ever try to spin one? Asked Dr. Dorian. Mrs. Arbel shifted uneasily in her chair. No, she replied. But I can crochet a doily and I can knit a sock. Sure, said the doctor. But somebody taught you, didn't they? My mother taught me. Well, who taught a spider? A young spider knows how to spin a web without any instructions from anybody. Don't you regard that as a miracle? I suppose so, said Mrs. Arable. I never looked at it that way before. Still, I don't understand how those words got into the web. I don't understand it, and I don't like what I can't understand. None of us do, said Dr. Dorian, sighing. I'm a doctor. Doctors are supposed to understand everything. But I don't understand everything. I don't intend to let it worry me. Mrs. Arable fidgeted. Fern says that animals talk to each other, Dr. Dorian. Do you believe animals talk? I never heard one say anything, he replied. But that proves nothing. It's quite possible that an animal has spoken civilly to me and that I didn't catch the remark because I wasn't paying attention. Children pay better attention than grown-ups. If Fern says the animals in Zuckerman's barn talk, I'm quite ready to believe her. Perhaps if people talked less, animals would talk more. People are incessant talkers. I can give you my word on that. Well, I feel better about Fern, said Mrs. Arable. You don't think I have to worry about her? Does she look well? asked the doctor. Oh, yes. Appetite good? Oh, yes. She's always hungry. Sleep well at night? Oh, yes. Then don't worry, said the doctor. Do you think she'll ever start thinking about something besides pigs and sheep and geese and spiders? How old is Fern? She's eight. Well, said Dr. Dorian, I think she will always love animals, but I doubt that she spends her entire life in Homer Zuckerman's barn cellar. How about boys? Does she know any boys? She knows Henry Fussy, said Mrs. Arable brightly. Dr. Dorian closed his eyes and went into deep thought. Henry Fussy, he mumbled. Hmm, remarkable. Well, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Let Fern associate with her friends in the barn if she wants to. I would say offhand that spiders and pigs are, are fully as interesting as Henry Fussy. Yet I predict the day will come when even Henry Fussy will drop some chance remark that catches Fern's attention. It's amazing how children change from year to year. How is Avery? he asked, opening his eyes wide. Oh, Avery, chuckled Mrs. Arable. Avery is always fine. Of course, he gets into poison ivy and gets stung by wasps and bees and brings frogs and snakes home and breaks everything he lays his hands on. He's fine. Good, said the doctor. Mrs. Arable said goodbye and thanked Dr. Dorian very much for his advice. She felt greatly relieved. Chapter 15. The Crickets. The crickets sang in the grasses. They sang the song of summer's ending, a sad, monotonous song. Summer is over and gone, they sang, over and gone, over and gone. Summer is dying, dying. The crickets felt it was their duty to warn everybody that summer cannot last forever. Even on the most beautiful days in the whole year, the days when summer is changing in the fall, the crickets spread the rumors of sadness and change. Everybody heard the song of the crickets, Avery and Fern Arbel, heard it as they walked the dusty road. They knew that school would soon begin again. The young geese heard it and knew that they would never be little goslings again. Charlotte heard it and knew that she hadn't had much time left. Miss Zuckerman, at work in the kitchen, heard the crickets, and a sadness came over her too. Another summer gone, she sighed. Lurvy at work building a crate for Wilbur, heard the song and knew it was time to dig potatoes. Summer is over and gone, repeated the crickets. How many nights till frost? Sang the crickets. Goodbye, summer. Goodbye, goodbye. The sheep heard the crickets, and they felt so uneasy that they broke a hole in the pasture fence and wandered up into the fields across the road. The gander discovered the hole and led his family through, and they walked to the orchard and ate the apples that were laying on the ground. A little maple tree in the swamp heard the cricket song and turned bright red with anxiety. Wilbur was now the center of attraction on the farm. Good food and regular hours were showing results. Wilbur was a pig any man would be proud of. One day, more than a hundred people came to stand at his yard and admire him. Charlotte had written the word radiant, and Wilbur really looked radiant as he stood in the golden sunlight. Ever since the spider had befriended him, he had done his very best to live up to his reputation. 
When Charlotte's Webb said some pig, Wilbur had tried hard to look like some pig. When Charlotte's Webb said terrific, Wilbur had tried to look terrific. And now that the Webb said radiant, he did everything possible to make himself glow. It is not easy to look radiant, but Wilbur threw himself into it with a will. He would turn his head slightly and blink his long eyelashes. Then he would breathe deeply. And when his audience grew bored, he would spring into the air and do a backflip with a half twist. At this, the crowd would yell and cheer. How is that for a pig? Mr. Zuckerman would ask, well pleased with himself. That pig is radiant. Some of Wilbur's friends in the barn worried for fear that all the attention would go to his head and make him stuck up, but it never did. Wilbur was modest. Fame did not spoil him. He still worried about the future, as he could hardly believe that a mere spider would be able to save his life. Sometimes at night he would have a bad dream. He would dream that men were coming to get him with knives and guns. But that was only a dream. In the daytime, Wilbur usually felt happy and confident. No pig had ever had truer friends. And he realized that friendship is one of the most satisfying things in the world. Even the song of the crickets did not make Wilbur too sad. He knew it was almost time for the county fair, and he was looking forward to the trip. If he could distinguish himself at the fair and maybe win some prize money, he was sure Mr. Zuckerman would let him live. Charlotte had worries on her of her own, but she kept quiet about them. One morning, Wilbur asked her about the fair. You're going with me, aren't you, Charlotte? He asked. Well, I don't know, replied Charlotte. The fair comes at a bad time for me. I shall find it inconvenient to leave home, even for a few days. Why, well, asked Wilbur. Oh, I just don't feel like leaving my web. Too much going on around here. Please come with me, begged Wilbur. I need you, Charlotte. I can't stand going to the fair without you. You've just got to come. No, said Charlotte. I believe I'd better stay home and see if I can't get some work done. What kind of work, asked Wilbur. Egg laying. It's time I made an egg sack and filled it with eggs. I didn't know you could lay eggs, said Wilbur in amazement. Oh, sure, said the spider. I'm versatile. What does versatile mean? Full of eggs, asked Wilbur. Certainly not, said Charlotte. Versatile means I can turn with ease from one thing to another. It means I don't have to limit my activities to spinning and trapping and stunts like that. Why don't you come to the fairgrounds and lay your eggs there, did Wilbur. It would be wonderful fun. Charlotte gave her web a twitch and moodily washed its way. I'm afraid not, she said. You don't know the first thing about egg laying, Wilbur. I can't arrange my family duties to suit the management of the county fair. When I get ready to lay eggs, I have to lay eggs, fair or no fair. However, I don't want you to worry about it. You might lose weight. We'll leave it this way. I'll come to the fair if I possibly can. Oh, good, said Wilbur. I knew you wouldn't forsake me just when I needed you most. All that day, Wilbur stayed inside, taking life easy in the straw. Charlotte rested and needed a grasshopper. She knew that she couldn't help Wilbur much longer. In a few days, she would have to drop everything and build the beautiful little sack that would hold her eggs. Off to the fair. The night before the county fair, everybody went to bed early. Fern and Avery were in bed by eight. Avery lay dreaming that the Ferris wheel had stopped and that he was in the top car. Fern lay dreaming that she was getting sick in the swings. Lurvy was in bed by 8.30. He lay dreaming that he was throwing baseballs at a cloth cap and winning a genuine Navajo blanket. Mr. and Mrs. Zuckerman were in bed by nine. Mrs. Zuckerman lay dreaming about a deep freeze unit. Mr. Zuckerman lay dreaming about Wilbur. He dreamt that Wilbur had grown until he was 116 feet long and 92 feet high and that he had won all the prizes at the fair and was covered with blue ribbons and even had a blue ribbon tied to the end of his tail. Down in the barn cellar, the animals, too, went to sleep early, all except Charlotte. Tomorrow would be fair day. Every creature planned to get up early to see Wilbur off on his great adventure. When morning came, everybody got up at daylight. The day was hot. Up the road at the Arable's house, Fern lugged a pail of hot water to her room and took a sponge bath. 
Then she put on her prettiest dress because she knew she would see boys at the fair. Mrs. Arable scrubbed the back of Avery's neck and wet his hair and parted it and brushed it down hard till it stuck to the top of his head. All but six hairs that stood straight up. Avery put on clean underwear, clean blue jeans, and a clean shirt. Mr. Arable dressed, ate breakfast, and then went out and polished his truck. He had offered to drive everybody to the fair, including Wilbur. Bright and early, Lurvy put clean straw in Wilbur's crate and lifted it into the pig pen. The crate was green and gold letters that said, Zuckerman's Famous Pig. Charlotte had her web looking fine for the occasion. Wilbur ate his breakfast slowly. He tried to look radiant without getting his food in his ears. In the kitchen, Mrs. Zuckerman suddenly made an announcement. Homer, she said to her husband, I'm going to give that pig a buttermilk bath. A what? said Mr. Zuckerman. A buttermilk bath. My grandmother used to bathe her pigs with buttermilk when they got dirty. I just remembered. Wilbur is not dirty, said Mr. Zuckerman proudly. He's filthy behind the ears, said Mrs. Zuckerman. Every time Lurvy slops him, the food runs down around his ears. Then it dries and forms a clear crust. He also has a smudge on his side where he lays in the manure. He lays in the clean straw, corrected Mr. Zuckerman. Well, he's dirty and he's going to have to have a bath. Mr. Zuckerman sat down weakly and ate a donut. His wife went to the woodshed. And when she returned, she wore rubber boots and an old raincoat and carried a bucket of buttermilk and a small wooden paddle. Edith, you're crazy, mumbled Zuckerman. But she paid no attention to him. Together they walked to the pig pen. Mrs. Zuckerman wasted no time. She climbed in with Wilbur and went to work. Dipping her paddle in the buttermilk, she rubbed him all over. The geese gathered around to see the fun, and so did the sheep and the lambs. Even Templeton poked his head out cautiously to watch Wilbur get a buttermilk bath. Charlotte got so interested that she lowered herself on a drag line so she could see better. Wilbur stood still and closed his eyes. He could feel the buttermilk trickling down his sides. He opened his mouth some and the buttermilk ran in. It was delicious. He felt radiant and happy. When Mrs. Zuckerman got through and rubbed him dry, he was the cleanest, prettiest pig you ever saw. He was pure white, pink around the ears and snout, and smooth as silk. The Zuckermans went up to change into their clothes. Lurvy went to shave and put on his plaid shirt and his purple necktie. The animals were left to themselves in the barn. The seven goslings paraded around and around their mother. Please, please, please take us to the fair, begged a gosling. Then all seven began teasing to go. Please, 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 please. They all made a, quite a racket. Children, snapped the goose. We're staying quietly, quietly, quietly at home. Only Wilbur, Ilbur, Ilbur is going to the fair. Just then, Charlotte interrupted. I shall go too, she said softly. I've decided to go with Wilbur. He may need me. We can't tell what might happen at the fairgrounds. Somebody's got to go along who knows how to write. And I think Templeton better come too. I might need somebody to run errands and do general work. I'm staying right here, grumbled the rat. I haven't the slightest interest in fairs. That's because you've never been to one, remarked an old sheep. A fair is a rat's paradise. Everybody spills food at the fair. A rat can creep out late at night and have a feast. In the horse barn, you'll find the oats that trotters and pacers have spilled. In the trampled grass of the infield, you'll find an old discarded lunch boxes containing foul remains of peanut butter sandwiches, hard-boiled eggs, cracker bits, cracker crumbs, bits of donuts, and particles of cheese. In the hard-packed dirt of the midway, after the glaring lights are out and the people have gone home to bed, you'll find veritable treasure of popcorn fragments, 
frozen custard dripplings, candied apples abandoned by tired children, sugar fluff crystals, salted almonds, pop popsicles, partially gnawed ice cream cones, and wooden sticks of lollipops. Everywhere is loot for a rat, in tents, in booths, in haylofts. Why, a fair has enough disgusting leftovers to satisfy a whole army of rats. Templeton's eyes were blazing. Is this true? he asked. Is this appetizing yarn of yours true? I like high living and what you say tempts me. It is true, said the old sheep. Go to the fair, Templeton. You will find the conditions at the fair will surpass your wildest dreams. Buckets with sour mash sticking to them, tin cans containing particles of tuna fish, greasy paper big bags filled with rotten... That's enough, cried Templeton. Don't tempt me any more. I'm going. Good, said Charlotte, winking at the old sheep. Now then, there is no time to be lost. Wilbur will soon be put into the crate. Templeton and I must get in the crate right now and hide ourselves. The rat didn't waste a minute. He scampered over to the crate, crawled between the slats, and pulled straw up over him so he was hidden from sight. All right, said Charlotte, I'm next. She sailed into the air, let out a drag line, and dropped gently to the ground. Then she climbed the side of the crate and hid herself into, inside a knot hole in the top board. The old sheep nodded. What a cargo, she said. That sign ought to say Zuckerman's famous pig and two stowaways. Look out, the people are coming, umming, umming, shouted the gander. Cheese it, cheese it, cheese it. The big truck with Mr. Arabelle at the wheel backed slowly down toward the barnyard. Larvy and Mr. Zuckerman walked alongside. Fern and Avery were standing in the body of the truck, hanging on to the sideboards. Listen to me, whispered the old sheep to Wilbur. When they open the crate and try to put you in, struggle. Don't go without a tussle. Pigs always resist when they are being loaded. If I struggle, I'll get dirty, said Wilbur. Never mind that. Do as I say. Struggle. If you were to walk into the crate without resisting, Zuckerman might think you were bewitched. He'd be scared to go to the fair. Templeton poked his head up through the straw. Struggle if you may, must, said, said he, but kindly remember that I'm hiding down here in this crate, and I don't want to be stepped on, or kicked in the face, or pummeled, or crushed in any way, or squashed, or buffeted around, or bruised, or lacerated, or scarred, or biffed. Just watch what you're doing, Mr. Radiant, when they get shoving you in. Be quiet, Templeton, said the sheep. Pull in your head, they're coming. Look radiant, Wilbur. Lay low, Charlotte. Talk it up, geese. The truck backed slowly to the pig pen and stopped. Mr. Arabelle cut the motor, got out, walked around the rear, and lowered the tailgate. The geese cheered. Mrs. Arabelle got out of the truck. Fern and Avery jumped to the ground. Mrs. Zuckerman came walking down from the house. Everybody lined up at the fence and stood for a moment admiring Wilbur in the beautiful green crate. Nobody realized that the crate already contained a rat and a spider. That's some pig, said Mrs. Arabelle. He's terrific, said Larby. He's very radiant, said Fern, remembering the day he was born. Well, said Mrs. Zuckerman, he's clean anyway. The buttermilk certainly helped. Mr. Arabelle studied studied Wilbur carefully. Yes, he's a wonderful pig, he said. It's hard to believe that he was the runt of the litter. You'll get some extra good ham and bacon, Homer, when it comes time to kill that pig. Wilbur heard these words and his heart almost stopped. I think I'm going to faint, he whispered to the old, the old sheep who was watching. Kneel down, whispered the old sheep. Let the blood rush to your head. Wilbur sank to his knees, all radiance gone, his eyes closed. Look, screamed Fern, he's fading away. Hey, watch me, yelled Avery, crawling on all fours into the crate. I'm a pig, I'm a pig. Avery's foot touched Templeton under the straw. What a mess, thought the rat. What fantastic creatures boys are. Why did I let myself in for this? The geese saw Avery in the, cre in the crate and cheered. Avery, you get out of the, that crate this instant, commanded his mother. What do you think you are? I'm a pig, cried Avery, tossing handfuls of stra straw into the air. Oink, oink, oink. 
The truck is rolling away, Papa, said Fern. The truck, with no, with no one at the wheel, had started to ro roll downhill. Mr. Arabelle dashed to the driver's seat and pulled on the emergency brake. The truck stopped. The geese cheered. Charlotte crouched and made herself as small as possible in the knot hole so Avery wouldn't see her. Come on at once, cried Mrs. Arabelle. Avery crawled out of the crate on his hands and knees, making faces at Wilbur. Wilbur fainted away. The pig has passed out, said Mrs. Zuckerman. Throw him up, throw water on him. Throw buttermilk, suggested Avery. The geese cheered. Lurvy ran for a pail of water. Fern climbed into the pen and knelt by Wilbur's side. It's sunstroke, said Zuckerman. The heat is too much for him. Maybe he's dead, said Avery. Come out of that pig pen immediately, cried Mrs. Arabelle. Avery obeyed his mother and climbed into the back of the truck so he could see better. Lurvy returned with cold water and dashed it on Wilbur. Throw some on me, cried Wil Avery. I'm hot too. Oh, keep quiet, hollered Fern. Keep quiet. Her eyes were brimming with tears. Wilbur, feeling the cold water, came too. He rose slowly to his feet while the, ge the geese cheered. He's up, said Mr. Arable. I guess there's nothing wrong with him. I'm hungry, said Avery. I want a candied apple. Wilbur's all right now, said Fern. We can start. I want to take a ride in the Ferris wheel. Mr. Zuckerman and Mr. Arable and Louvery grabbed the pig and pushed him headfirst toward the crate. Wilbur began to struggle. The harder the men pushed, the harder he held back. Avery jumped down and joined the men. Wilbur kicked and thrashed and grunted. Nothing's wrong with this pig, said Mr. Zuckerman cheerfully, pressing his knee against Wilbur's behind. All together now, boys, shove! With a final heave, they jammed him into the crate. The geese cheered. Louvery kneeled some boards across the end so Wilbur couldn't back out. Then, using all their strength, the men picked up the crate and heaved it aboard the truck. They did not know that under the straw was a rat and inside a knot hole with a big gray spider. They saw only a pig. Everybody in, called Mr. Arabelle. He started the motor. The ladies climbed in beside him. Mr. Zuckerman and Louvery and Fern and Avery rode in the back, hanging onto the sideboards. The truck began to move ahead. The geese cheered. The children answered their cheer and they and away went everybody to the fair. Chapter 17, Uncle. When they pulled into the fairgrounds, they could hear music and see the Ferris wheel turning in the sky. They could smell the dust of the racetrack where the sprinkling cart had moistened it, and they could smell hamburgers frying and see balloons aloft. They could hear sheep rattling in their pens. An enormous voice overhead, the loudspeaker said, Attention, please! Will the owner of a Pontiac car, license number H2439, please move your car away from the fireworks shed? Can I have some money, asked Fern. Can I too, asked Avery. I'm going to win a doll by spinning a wheel and it will stop at the right number, said Fern. I'm going to steer a jet plane and make it bump into another one. Can I have a balloon, asked Fern. Can I have a frozen custard and a cheeseburger and some raspberry soda pop, asked Avery. You children be quiet while we get the pig unloaded, said Mrs. Arabelle. Let's let the children go off by themselves, suggested Mr. Arable. The fair only comes once a year. Mr. Arable gave Fern two quarters and two dimes. He gave Avery five dimes and four nickels. Now run along, he said, and remember the money has to last all day. Don't spend it all in the first few minutes and be back here at the truck at noontime so we can all have lunch together. Oh, and don't eat a lot of stuff that's going to make you sick to your stomachs. And if you go into the swing, said Mrs. Arabelle, you hang on tight. You hang on very tight. You hear me? And don't get lost, said Mr. Zuckerman. And don't get dirty. Don't get overheated, said their mother. Watch out for the pickpockets, cautioned their father. And don't run across the track when the horses are coming, cried Mrs. Zuckerman. The children grabbed each other by the hand and danced off in the direction of the merry-go-round toward the wonderful music and the wonderful adventure and the wonderful excitement. Into this wonderful midway, where there would be no parents to guard them, guide them, and where they could be happy and free to do as they pleased. Mrs. Arabelle stood quietly and watched them go. Then she sighed. Then she blew her nose. Do you really think it's all right, she asked. Well, they've got to grow up sometime, said Mrs. Arable. And a fair is a good place to start, I guess. While Wilbur was being unloaded and taken out of his crate and into his new pig pen, crowds gathered to watch. 
They started at the sign, Zuckerman's Famous Pig. Wilbur stared back and tried to look extra good. He was pleased with his new home. The pen was grassy, and it was shaded from the sun by a shed roof. Charlotte, watching her chance, scrambled out of the crate and climbed a post to the underside of the roof. Nobody noticed her. Templeton, not wishing to come out in broad daylight, stayed quietly under the straw at the bottom of the crate. Mr. Zuckerman poured some milk, skim milk, into Wilbur's trough, pitched clean straw into his pen, and then he headed, and Mrs. Zuckerman and the Arables walked away towards the cattle barn to look at purebred cows and to see the sights. Mr. Zuckerman particularly wanted to look at tractors. Mrs. Zuckerman wanted to see a deep freeze. Lurvy wandered off by himself, hoping to meet friends and have some fun on the midway. As soon as the people were gone, Charlotte spoke to Wilbur. It's a good thing you can't see what I see, she said. What do you see? asked Wilbur. There's a pig in the next pen and he's enormous. I'm afraid he's much bigger than you are. Maybe he's older than I am and has had more time to grow, suggested Wilbur. Tears began to come to his eyes. I'll drop down and have a closer look, Charlotte said. Then she crawled along a beam. She was directly over the next pig pen. She let herself down on a drag line until she hung in the air just in front of the big pig's snout. May I have your name, she asked politely. The pig stared at her. No name, he said in a big hearty voice. Just call me uncle. Very well, uncle, replied Charlotte. What is the date of your birth? Are you a spring pig? Sure, I'm a spring pig, replied uncle. What did you think I was, a spring chicken? Ha ha, that's a good one, eh, sister? Mildly funny, said Charlotte. I have heard funnier ones, though. Glad to have met you, and now I must be going. She ascended down slowly and returned to Wilbur's pen. He claims he's a spring pig, reported Charlotte and perhaps he is. One thing is certain, he has a most unattractive personality. He is too familiar, too noisy, and he cracks weak jokes. Also, he's not anywhere near as clean as you are, nor as pleasant. I took quite a dislike to him in our brief interview. He's going to be a hard pig to beat though, Wilbur, on account of his size and weight but with me helping you, it can be done. When are you going to spin a web? asked Wilbur. This afternoon, late, if I'm not too tired, she said, said Charlotte. The least tires me these days. The least thing tires me these days. I don't seem to have the energy I once had. My age, I guess. Wilbur looked at his friend. She looked rather swollen, and she seemed le seemed listless. I'm awfully sorry to hear that you're feeling poorly, Charlotte, he said. Perhaps if you spin a web and catch a couple of flies, you'll feel better. Perhaps, she said wearily, but I feel like the end of a long day. Clinging upside down to the ceiling, she settled down for a nap, leaving Wilbur, Wilbur very much worried. All morning, people wandered past Wilbur's pen. Dozens and dozens of strangers stopped to stare at him and to admire his silky white coat, his curly tail, his kind and radiant expression. Then they would move on to the next pen where the bigger pig lay. Wilbur heard several people make favorable marks about Uncle's great size. He couldn't help overhearing these remarks and he couldn't help worrying. And now, with Charlotte not feeling well, he thought, oh dear. All morning, Templeton slept quietly under the straw. The day grew fiercely hot. At noon, the Zuckermans and the Arables returned to the pig pen. Then, a few minutes later, Fern and Avery showed up. Fern had a monkey doll in her arms and was eating Cracker Jack. Avery had a balloon tied to his ear and was chewing a candied apple. The children were hot and dirty. Isn't it hot, said Mrs. Zuckerman. It's terribly hot, said Mrs. Arable, fanning herself with an advertisement of a deep freeze. One by one, they climbed into the truck and opened lunch boxes. The sun beat down on everything. Nobody seemed hungry. When are the judges going to decide about Wilbur, asked Mrs. Zuckerman. Not till tomorrow, said Mr. Zuckerman. 
Larry appeared carrying an Indian blanket that he had won. That's just what we need, said Avery, a blanket. Of course it is, replied Larry, and he spread the blanket across the sideboards of the truck so that it was a little like a little tent. The children sat in the shade under the blanket and felt better. After lunch, they stretched out and fell asleep. Chapter 18, The Cool of the Evening In the cool of the evening, when shadows darkened the fairgrounds, Templeton crept from the crate and looked around. Wilbur lay asleep in the straw. Charlotte was building a web. Templeton's keen nose detected many fine smells in the air. The rat was hungry and thirsty. He decided to go exploring. Without saying anything to anybody, he started off. Bring me back a word, Charlotte called after him. I shall be writing tonight for the last time. The rat mumbled something to himself and disappeared into the shadows. He did not like being treated like a messenger boy. After the heat of the day, the evening came as a welcome relief to all. The Ferris wheel was lighted now. It went round and round in the sky and seemed twice as high as by day. There were lights on the midway and you could hear the crackle of the game gambling machines and the music of the merry-go-round and the voice of the man in the Beano booth calling numbers. The children felt refreshed after their nap. Fern met her friend Henry Fussy and he invited her to ride with him in the Ferris wheel. He even bought a ticket for her so it didn't cost her anything. When Mrs. Arable happened to look up into the starry sky and saw her little daughter sitting with Henry Fussy and going higher and higher into the air and saw how happy Fern looked, she just shook her head. My, my, she said, Henry Fussy, think of that. Templeton kept out of sight. In the tall grass behind the cattle barn, he found a folded newspaper. Inside it were leftovers from somebody's lunch, a deviled ham sandwich, a piece of Swiss cheese, part of a hard boiled egg and the core of a wormy apple. The rat crawled in and ate everything. Then he tore a word out of the paper, rolled it up, and started back to Wilbur's pen. Charlotte had her web almost finished when Templeton returned, carrying the newspaper clipping. She had left a space in the middle of the web. At this hour, no people were around the pig pen, so the rat and the spider and the pig were by themselves. I hope you brought a good one, Charlotte said. It is the last word I shall ever write. Here, said Templeton, unrolling the paper. What does it say, asked Charlotte. You'll have to read it for me. It says humble, replied the rat. Humble, said Charlotte. Humble has two meanings. It means not proud, and it means near the ground. That's Wilbur all over. He's not proud, and he's near the ground. Well, I hope you're satisfied, sneered the rat. I'm not going to spend all my time fetching and carrying. I came to this fair to enjoy myself, not to deliver papers. You've been very helpful, Charlotte said. Run along if you want to see more of the fair. The rat grinned. I'm going to make a night of it, he said. The old sheep was right. This fair is a rat's paradise. What eating and what drinking. And everywhere good hiding and good hunting. Bye-bye, my humble Wilbur. Fare thee well, Charlotte, you old schemer. This will be a night to remember in a rat's life. He vanished into the shadows. Charlotte went back to her work. It was quite dark now. In the distance, fireworks began going off, rockets scattering fiery balls in the sky. By the time the Arables and the Zuckermans and Lurvy returned from the grandstand, Charlotte had finished her web. The word humble was woven neatly in the center. Nobody noticed it in the darkness. Everyone was tired and happy. Fern and Avery climbed into the truck and lay down. They pulled the Indian blanket over them. Lurvy gave Wilbur a forkful of fresh straw. Mr. Arable patted him. Time for us to go home, he said to the pig. See you tomorrow. The grown-ups climbed slowly into the truck and Wilbur heard the engine start and then heard the truck moving away in low speed. He would have felt lonely and homesick had Charlotte not been with him. He never felt lonely when she was near. In the distance, he could still hear the music of the merry-go-round. As he was dropping off to sleep, he spoke to Charlotte. Sing me that song again about the dung in the dark, he begged. Not tonight, she said in a low voice. I'm too tired. Her voice didn't seem to come from her web. Where are you? asked Wilbur. I can't see you. Are you on your web? I'm back here, she answered, up in this back corner. Why aren't you on your web? asked Wilbur. You almost never leave your web. I've left it tonight, she said. Wilbur closed his eyes. Charlotte, he said, 
after a while. Do you really think Zuckerman will let me live and not kill me when the cold weather comes? Do you really think so? Of course, said Charlotte. You are a famous pig, and you are a good pig. Tomorrow you will probably win a prize. The whole world will hear about you. Zuckerman will be proud and happy to own such a pig. You have nothing to fear, Wilbur, nothing to worry about. Maybe you'll live forever. Who knows? And now go to sleep. For a while, there was no sound. Then Wilbur's voice. What are you doing up there, Charlotte? Oh, making something, she said. Making something as usual. Is it something for me? asked Wilbur. No, said Charlotte. It's something for me for a change. Please tell me what it is, begged Wilbur. I'll tell you in the morning, she said. When the first light comes into the sky and the sparrows stir and the cows rattle their chains, when the rooster crows and the stars fade, when early cars whisper along the highway, you look up here and I'll show you something. I will show you my masterpiece. Before she finished the sentence, Wilbur was asleep. She could tell by the sound of his breathing that he was sleeping peacefully deep in the straw. Miles away at the Arable's house, the men sat around the kitchen table eating a dish of canned peaches and talking over the events of the day. Upstairs, Avery was already in bed and asleep. Miss Arable was tucking Fern into bed. Did you have a good time at the fair, she asked as she kissed her daughter. Fern nodded. I had the best time I have ever had anywhere or any time in all of my whole life. Well, said Miss Arable, isn't that nice?